科技时代的来临，必须仰仗产官学三方的共同合作，才可以带来更大幅的进步。因此呢，今天本院也很荣幸地邀请到台湾政治史上首位数位政委唐凤莅临现场，和我们分享在虚拟实境纪元，让想象奔驰。唐凤政委将以英文发表，所以需要口误易服务的朋友可以带上口译设备。我们掌声欢迎唐凤政委
Okay, now for the next uh, 15 minutes, I'll be talking in very broad brushes about uh, my uh, personal use of virtual reality and shared reality, as I prefer to call it, uh, in my everyday job. Uh, and it is just a very beginning, a glimpse of what we are going to provide for democracy. Uh, and I would also invite you to think of new possibilities and maybe share with us uh, on the slide. So I'd like to, to begin with my job description. Um, three years ago, when I became the additional minister, um, the HR people asked me, so, minister, this is the first time that Owen has an additional minister, and we would like you to share what's your vision, what are you going to do in the next three years uh, as additional minister. And I'm like, this is really easy. Um, as Chairperson uh, Wang has shared, sustainable development goals uh, has just been ratified. Uh, the year before that in 2015. So I said, my work is really simple. It is just the sustainable targets, 1718, 1717, and 176. That's like the shortest job description ever. Uh, but um, really what it means is to enhance the availability of reliable data, to encourage effective cross-sectoral partnerships, and share knowledge in an open fashion. And the HR people in the cabinet is like, Minister, nobody memorized the sustainable targets, uh, and nobody knows them by heart at that time. Uh, there's 169 of them, and so you have to explain in plain language. And so I just translated those three sustainable targets into plain language, and that is kind of the roadmap of how we're deploying technology, including virtual reality. So I'll first share my job description with you. It goes like this. With, we see the Internet of Things. Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's literally my job, job description. And the work that we're doing in Taiwan is making sure that everybody who previously thought that the social progress, the social development is a kind of zero-sum game, a tug of war, between, say, economic development on one side and uh, environmental sustainability on the other, or technological innovation on one side and social justice on the other. In traditional thinking in public administration, what's called representative democracy is that we have representatives that represent those different interests. We have different legislators in different committees. We have ministers of uh, various ministries. Each ministry, of course, represents one value. And this road in between is the career public service that absorbs all the tension, is uh, invisible to the public, uh, and tries very hard not to break uh, when emerging technology comes. Of course, they, they break from time to time, thanks to the great social technology called the hashtag. Um, but the hashtag is a new-ish invention that basically says anybody who cares deeply about something, like hashtag me too, hashtag climate strike, um, hashtag ice bucket challenge, uh, hashtag really anything, can organize among themselves without a representative, without anyone that serves the single points of negotiation. And so the traditional way of negotiation between those different representatives breaks down because we simply cannot make a new agency or a new legislative council for each of the emerging technologies for VR, um, for blockchains, uh, for self-driving vehicles, and so on. And so the way we govern must change. And the way we govern um, has changed to what the UN this year calls it co-gov, or collaborative governance. Instead of asking, who are the representatives and how can we strike a balance between them? We ask a different set of questions, we ask. So people have different positions. Can then someone find a space where people take all the sides to fill the positions of each other 
and that is not a common values. And that given the common values, can we find innovations that makes life better for all the different positions without sacrificing any position? And the foundation of collaborative governance is transparency and is trust. And trust is based on literally the capability of stepping to each other's shoes. And so that is what where virtual reality comes to play. This is literally my office. And it is also a uh, VR studio. It has all the, actually, HTC equipment. <laughs> and, um, no, yeah, I, I uh, bought uh, the very first device, I think, uh, the, the 20s or something, uh, in zero number. Uh, and uh, it has plenty, this space has plenty of rooms. Uh, for people to uh, participate in teleconferences using empowered by virtual reality. And this public art is designed, uh, drawn by people with Down syndrome, uh, people with trisomy differences. We may see the world uh, through the lens of text or through numbers, uh, but people with Down syndrome see the world through the lens of geometry and topology. And so when they draw out whatever uh, they perceive in the world, and we pr preserve them uh, in 3D scan models uh, that would be they're reenacted as public art. We step into their world that makes all of us more creative. And so this is uh, a very important thing in that when people step into the space, they can automatically envision new dimensions and new possibilities. Every Wednesday up here, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., Anybody can just step into the space. There's no wall uh, in the space. We tore down uh, one side of the wall and uh, made uh, transparent the other side of the wall. And so it's near the Central Park in Taipei. It's called the Dada Park. It's just next to the Jingwu Flower Market. So we have plenty of people who just shop in Jingwu Flower Market and then step into this connected room uh, of virtual reality. And they see a lot of different things. For example, they may see what they like in the most rural, indigenous, and rural Because every other Tuesday or so, I tour around Taiwan, bringing with me a 360 uh, video camera, and that shows the setting in uh, various uh, ways. And it's all uh, live streamed, uh, if the local people is uh, okay with it. And so you can very easily see that in my channel. There's plenty of 360 feet. The uh, latest one is from the Shilin District Court, uh, where I just played the role of a virtual judge uh, as a robot. Uh, and they just uh, went through this whole court proceeding, uh, but with a lot of people just wa watching uh, through 360. And it's not limited uh, to Taiwan either. Uh, for example, I was in Madrid. Um, but the week that I became a uh, digital minister. Uh, and uh, in Madrid, there was this uh, YouTube. This is great. This is right. Right, so, this is literally the shooting history court. And you can literally see me there. I'm, I'm the iPad there. Um, so, uh, in, in the seat of the judge, and people learn about this whole uh, court proceeding. Uh, and you can also see that people are, uh, during the live stream, also contributing their ideas uh, when it comes to the court proceedings. So that it demystifies a democratic process, it demystifies the court process, and it makes sure that people can learn about all the different perspectives in the democratic process. This is something that the jury system is designed to do, so that people can take turns involved in democracy, but uh, through 360 live streaming and through virtual reality, people can really empathize uh, with the judge's work. People can really empathize with the democratic process. And the same uh, we uh, apply it in the international setting also. So this is, was the first time uh, that I used uh, virtual reality that was in November 2016, and this was in Spain, uh, in Miguela Prado. And the person uh, talking to me uh, is uh, Pablo Soto, a, a city councillor uh, who is also handicapped. And so uh, I literally walked the same rampways, <laughs> going through the same uh, path 
as he did uh, in his wheelchair, and we are co-mentors uh, for the VR Creative C Media Lab product, uh, and we just uh, taught the students how the world looks differently from our perspective uh, in virtual reality. And so they designed uh, their cities, they designed their local councils, their participatory budget, and so on, taking care of the universal access and also taking care of the children uh, who uh, perceive the constructions and the work from different angles. And after a week uh, of mentorship using this robot, uh, which they called Galatia, it's an excellent name, um, I, I was able to uh, be inside physically uh, through a um, live uh, headset, feel that I'm embedded in Spain, Miguel uh, Prado. And then I flew to Miguel uh, Prado a week after the workshop. So for the students there, I switched from the body of uh, silicon to a body of carbon, but it is a same continuous uh, existence, and I was able to pick up right where we left off and continue the mentorship uh, with the local uh, students. And so this, again, I think echoes um, Chairperson Wang's point that VR is a great empathy device that across the different um, environments, people were then able to literally step into each other's shoes and feel an empathy to it. And so after those uh, brief experiments starting 2017, we embedded that into our institutional setting. And so everybody can see uh, in this website, si.taiwan.gov.tw, the social innovation website, um, that there's more than 400 uh, organizations devoted to the sustainable goals in Taiwan, and any of them can summon me. Uh, every other Tuesday or so uh, to their local vicinity. So I think this was in Hualien. And we also go to uh, even more remote and rural and indigenous places. And so what we do in this setting is that people meet where they always meet already. They meet in their town halls or in their local indigenous um, uh, elders' um, place. And <clears throat> instead of bringing all the ministers there, it's just me, it's a very small staff that travels. And when we're there, um, I just sit down with the local people. I usually travel a day or two before, so I uh, can spend a day or two um, doing an ethnographic or just hanging out uh, with local people to make sure that I'm embedded uh, into their local culture. And then we have a town hall discussion. Everybody who meets in the town halls is um, able then to raise their specific points with the evidence that are already kind of 360 captured or somehow video captured. And bringing with me then, uh, as um, organized by the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei, is five municipal social innovation labs and units and with 12 different ministries, each sending someone who is section chief or a higher level. And to them, they are sitting uh, in Taipei or Taichung or Kaohsiung or Taoyuan or uh, Taidong or Hualien. And then they just sit uh, in a kind of fishbowl setting where using the uh, cameras in the local uh, place, the local people set the agenda for the 12 ministries to respond to. And this has two benefits. First, uh, aside from less travel and less carbon footprint, this has two uh, benefits. The first one is that instead of their local agenda being abstracted as two PowerPoint pages or three word page documents uh, and always received by a ministry to copy another ministry to copy another ministry, each time they copy, as I said, it was abstracted kind of the wrong way. It was abstracted as numbers, as text, and not as local people's experiences. And so whenever, for example, the Ministry of Economy copies the Ministry of Interior or copy the Ministry of Culture and so on, each successive copy loses some of the original uh, ethnographic context. And so many times in the central uh, government, we feel that we have solved a question, a problem, but we maybe solved it uh, just for 60%, uh, but then the remaining 40%, maybe we make new problems. Uh, for the local people, and this is very um, frequent. Uh, but now, in this setting, people were able then to step into the local people's shoes 
and they may raise a point. For example, uh, there was a incident uh, where in the Orchid Island, uh, there was a local clinic uh, that um, treats someone uh, who is injured or is sick. And usually, the local people will insist that they send helicopters to bring their loved ones back uh, to the main Taiwan island. And because of that, um, there was a case um, uh, a year or two ago uh, where it was raining and it was at night, uh, and the helicopter crashed uh, along with the local nurse uh, on it, and it was uh, a large news back then. And so through this regional tours, we were able to discover this is fundamentally not about the local clinic equipment or the local clinic's uh, settings. It is fundamentally about trust. And the local clinic and the nurses told us that they did not feel trusted by the local people because even though they wanted to uh, have a co-collaboration with the specialized doctors in the Taiwan main island, the current legal design, the current law at that point, a couple years ago, forbids this kind of uh, setting where the local nurse makes a medical treatment and diagnosis with the supervision of a specialized doctor in the Taiwan main island. It has to be a doctor that's physically nearby instead of uh, someone from the remote. And so because of that, did not feel that they earned much uh, when they were in the remote island because all the serious cases then was flown back to the Taiwan main island. And that, that was a real case that was very difficult to get into the root cause without this kind of listening by the local people setting the agenda and by all the ministries involved in it. And so through this way, we were able to gather a shared narrative that the uh, municipal governments, the central governments, and so on, are able to literally step into each other's shoes and take each other's sides, and so that improves trust. This is compared to the uh, old ways of institution, uh, where if they innovate um, and you know it works really well, um, it doesn't scale. It doesn't automatically transfer to other municipalities or other rural settings. And if they say something. Uh, that um, upsets the local people, usually the public service takes the blame. But uh, in a virtual town hall meeting, this is reversed. If they innovate and find out something that really works, they form a team in, for example, the presidential hackathon, and they get the credit. And if they say something that upsets the local people, I am the only one in reality, so I absorb all the risk. If the local people get really upset, you can't really hurt people uh, over virtual reality. And so by absorbing all the risk and uh, spreading the credit, this creates a second uh, um, benefit for this kind of uh, virtual town hall, is that everybody then argue for the public benefit. Because people know that whether it is the office hour visits, whether it is the uh, sustainable development goal uh, based social innovation tours, each uh, person's uh, statement, everything that is said, will be uh, recorded uh, for perpetuity, actually, um, on a distributed ledger uh, called GitHub. Uh, and then uh, people can very easily see that after I become the additional minister, I've talked with 4,000 people on over 200,000 speeches, over 1,000 sections. And each of them is not just a summary. People can really feel how is it like to be in those different uh, places to uh, talk through different stakeholders and so on. And so that gives trust by radically trusting people to speak for the public good. We create a space in which that is impossible to hurt each other. I mean, virtual reality is impossible to hurt each other. And also, it may show that instead of like private lobbying, uh, where people tend to speak about something that's good for them and maybe not so good for everybody else, we create a new kind of public space where everybody who comes talks about public benefits and the sustainable goals because they know that this is an additive uh, place. This is a distributed ledger, so you can only add to it and you cannot subtract from it. And so that um, concludes my sharing. I would uh, sincerely um, encourage you to like each other's questions during the coffee break and uh, bring new questions so that we have more uh, agenda to work with in our panel. And finally, I would like to share a very short snippet of poetry uh, that I wrote uh, a, a, few, a couple weeks ago that talks about this way of uh, policy making 
I think this is, is at the root of Taiwan, where we now have around 20 national languages, and we are uh, basically continuing and amplifying the languages of many different cultures. And the VR and this way of remote policy making brings a space where we can transcend our own pers personal individual culture and view the same uh, world, the same uh, policy through the lens of various different cultures. And so this is fundamentally a transcultural setting. And so my short snippet, which I'll conclude this talk with, reads like this. Whirling ocean, beautiful islands, a transcultural republic of citizens. Thank you. Pictures. 
uh, than something that provokes outrage. They are not always successful, though. So I would like to ask um, our panelists, what's your experience with social media? And social VR may be thought as the ultimate form of social media because we can literally feel proximate proximity with each other. And so what are the drawbacks that you have found? And are there any challenges that you think that currently we need to work collectively to surmount those challenges? Maybe let's begin uh, with the, the NPM. <laughs> 这个可能在所有的两种模式是藏语说不太会使数位多媒体时代我的年纪已经占了第一个我的年纪第二个我的原来学科背景是一个比较低度使用的但是也可能意味着我会去强调任何新科技的出现一定是会伴随着新的问题这些新的问题必须有一些新的规则跟新的伦理要不然我们就没有办法进到实际上的那一个新的社会里面去那个新的社会就是一个没有办法走到的社会我想人类的社会一直都是这样的三百年前我们需
of course, with social media, we, we had a, a new question in society, like Me Too, or all these things about women, or about rights. And perhaps we can say for a museum, this, this question arrived, and we, we had to, to deal with it. So we, we could say that uh, this, uh, this changing of uh, mentality uh, would impact, of course, uh, our programmation in museum, and we would uh, be more inclined to, to present, let's say, uh, women artists, or the question of, uh, uh, of uh, minorities, and, and so on. So that's just what, what I can say. I mean, the social media in uh, communication or, or way to like, like the me talk, uh, we, we have to, to invent storytelling and so on, that's, that's true. But uh, perhaps the most, the, the deepest uh, impact would be the change of mentality. Obviously. I think that throughout history, we have seen that when there is technological innovation, you can be a force for good or it can be a force of evil, and it depends in whose hand that innovation is. One of the things that Alphonse Walker said during his lifetime was, I never wanted my art to destroy, but always to build bridges. And so when we use our social media and when we communicate with people using those tools, we always try to have this ethical force behind what we're doing and to be able to, to find ways to bring people together. And I think that it's our shared responsibility as custodians of the world's culture to try to use new technologies as a force of good. Yes, I was just quickly asking. Um, yes, I'd like to echo what Martha said. I think it's the medium that you just, it depends on how you use it, whether it's bad and good. And I think it's just a new way of communication. And with arts, I think it's a very good um, platform for people to share their art and their views. So, you know, with our experience, I feel like what we do is very important that you send the message out, and social media is a good channel and platform to do so. Thank you. So, uh, everyone here <laughs> agrees that uh, the antisocial and the prosocial tendencies are not like naturally prosocial, that we have to co design the norm for the prosocial part together. Uh, I personally uh, engage in a virtual reality world called high fidelity. Uh, and while I said in my speech that one cannot hurt each other in virtual reality, one can harass people very easily by moving too close uh, and stalk uh, some avatar. And so they designed very quickly uh, what's called a bubble. But it's not a filter bubble, it is a force field bubble. That if you enact the bubble, then nobody can get like this close to you and they have to be talking about this business. And some kind of moderation like that, in moderation of course, uh, may be very good uh, in social media as well. So thank you for your insights. Um, so let's move on to the next question then. Uh, the next question with six people asking is, what's your view on the long-term impact and benefit of adopting in months of VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, in art and culture? Because VR and AR applying in a democratized way is a relatively new phenomenon. So what do you think? about, say, if we talk about the global goals, that's 2030, uh, or even beyond 2050 and so on, what do you think will be uh, the impact of the generation raised on AR and VR technologies in terms of art and culture? Um, so maybe let's start with that in the end. Uh, 因为这个像故宫这样的以古典艺术精品为主要收藏的博物院博物馆
所以从这一个呃这一些科技可以帮我们忙的这一角角度来说，其实它是让我们这个呃多少呃降低这些门槛，用各种各样的呃方法让这个门槛可以降低，这对我们来说是好好处。但是其实也就是因为我们是古典艺术精品。所以我们也不太希望这一个科技那么强力的呃介入我们这个领域，因为因为我曾经听过啊，科技的专家跟我们说，他们已经几乎可以让我们专家都难以分辨出它是复制品的时候，老师说我心里哎。也也是默默的啊，呃，也就是说，也就是说，其实呃，这里就有一个很重要的拿捏的问题。我们对我们来说，我们是既呃爱又怕，的确有这个呃两难。所以也就是说，我们嗯这一种嗯像故宫这样的博物馆，我们应该借助。这些科技，但是这些科技应该在什么样的范围里面，或者是怎么样的适度使用？我想这以后会是我们的新的课题。无论是我们的呃同仁也好，像我这种现在在当经营者的人也好，都是一个呃很大的挑战。所以我才说，老实说，我们是又爱又又爱又怕。You prefer being very honest and frank about it. Um, I, I learned that the NPM open data uh, platform uh, draws a line at the moment at 300 dpi, 300 dots per inch. Like everything below three, 300 dpi is released under Creative Commons for everybody to use. But then you cannot uh, distinguish that from the real one uh, at maybe this distance. But if you look in this distance, it's very easy to see that it's a lower resolution scan. Uh, but everything higher resolution at the moment in uh, NPM is not open data because uh, they want to, uh, for example, to conserve the idea that the original uh, still makes uh, some sense. But that is, of course, a collective challenge faced by all the museum and all the art institutions. So I would like to ask for your perspective too. It's quite difficult to say exactly what will be the effect in 2030, 2050. Uh, how can we all know? Uh, but of course, we are sure that there will be some effects. And um, the thing is about VR and about digitalization and uh, digital uh, creati creativeness. It's uh, it's both, uh, of course, very new, but it's not that new because it's in a way only a technology and. Uh, we have to uh, have in mind that the most important thing is human creativity and human creation. And um, if we are comparing VR to a printing process at the end of the 15th century, or comparing it to uh, the invention of photography at the middle of the 19th century, or cinema uh, at the end of the 19th century, of course, all of these technology uh, have had a very strong effect on creation, and of course we are, we have one. So to say what it will be is quite difficult to say, of course, but um, maybe, uh, and it's very striking when you are looking at, looking at the way uh, young people below 20 are using things. It's very interesting because they are able to, to deal with uh, academic uh, knowledge, and they are also able to make their way, their path, in uh, virtual reality because they are so, in fact, uh, so used to any uh, video games and things like that, and uh, in Taiwan, in France, in uh, everywhere in the world. So um, I don't know exactly what would be the effect, but certainly um, they are, I think, I don't know, it's only my, my personal vision, I think that they are very open-minded to, to any kind of uh, technology because they are used to, very open-minded to any new things. I'm not, because I'm into all of that, of course. And also, um, they are able to, um, to open new paths. And uh, because something, uh, I never play to any video game, but I have, uh, 
I have children that are not child anymore, but they are, I have children. And my uh, my youngest uh, my youngest son is uh, has been playing very much uh, video games. And when I look at him and look to uh, at his uh, as his friends, uh, I realize that they're able to um, to take new path, not only the main path, but also to new, to to, uh, to take secondary path. And I'm pretty sure that in terms of creation and creativity, it will help them to move further. How I don't know, of course, but maybe we can have an appointment for 2015 <laughs> if I want to discuss it. It will be great. That's awesome. Yeah, open spaces, open-ended games, and sandboxes like safe spaces is definitely very important for for the culture. Um, and would you like to add something? Uh, again, a uh, very, <laughs> very large question. Um, concerning, let's say, concerning art, uh, I think the, the VR is um, could could help for, or could could add, uh, could could um, bring us to two two aspects. So you have the the use of um, this technology to to go deeper in the comprehension or interpretation of work of art. So it's just a, a new way or a new technology to, to make more documentation or sort of mediation for, for public. So that's, that's it and it's, uh, we, we, we know it very uh, well. And the other aspect is, uh, is a sort of, it's not a, uh, virtual reality, but uh, virtual image. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a possibility to to replace or to, to, to think to replace uh, the, the original and to recreate uh, a work of art or, or installation in situ. And this aspect, uh, of course, is uh, problematic because it's uh, it's the same situation in in, uh, in video game. So you you just have a, a sort of a, a visuality, a new visuality, uh, and and you could you could imagine you are in a new reality. But uh, in for us in museum, of course, the question of originality or the, the, the work of art in original uh, couldn't be replaced. So it's, it's, it's a great question because uh, it could be a way to, for example, to like, like a solution when you have uh, too, much, uh, too much people in museum. <laughs> I imagine what to do, perhaps it's a, it could be a solution, or to avoid to to travel and so on, but it could uh, so it could create a sort of a, a inequality between the, the people who could who could pay to to see the originals and the others who could have a, a sort of bad reality, you know, a fake reality, and perhaps this is uh, our new world. The microphone, no, okay. Two, so two very important concepts. One is uh, what we talk about is access. It enables a fair and equal access to the originals. But the problematic uh, and subject to debate is the idea of a remix. Uh, like if you spend a lot of time with the original, which is great, but you would then want it to be something else, and that becomes problematic. I think just uh, building on what Dominique was saying about when you look at the technology of, say, cinema, when that was invented, and who could imagine what that would look like 30 years after it started. And for us as, as um, a foundation, one of the things that's always really exciting for us is to see how artists take uh, the work that Alphonse Mucha created more than 100 years ago, and then they use that as a jumping off point for their own creative ideas. And that's been something that's really been special as we've commissioned this uh, VR piece that I hope you all will have the chance to enjoy at uh, National Palace Museum and Southern Branch. Seeing how the creative artists and designers with whom we've worked have really taken aspects that we wouldn't necessarily have considered and have run with those and created their own really 
wonderful ideas. And I think that the, the, the people to ask about where virtual reality will be and where augmented reality will be in the art world uh, in, in 2050 is, is the artists and uh, the art students who are, who are coming up through the ranks today. Um, I think with Five Arts, when since we launched it in 2017, um, I think it's very clear for us, we always make sure that the things we do is to enhance the experience of whether it's museums or it's artistic experience, but it's not trying to replace it, and it's not trying to recreate a museum. I think that's very important. So when we work on the project, that we always ask, you know, what is the story that you wanted to tell. We ask the artists that questions. We ask, we ask you know, the museum's directors or the curators. So that's very important to us. I think with VR or AR, this kind of immersive technology, um, it's just like any other technology. It has different side of things, of course. But if you use it wisely, I think it's definitely beneficial. I think with VR, there are three main things. I think some people already touched upon that. So first is, I think it definitely um, helps the museums or organizations to somehow preserve those cultural heritage. I think a lot of artworks or where as artifact, I'm sure like well, the museum face that, the thing is two, 300 years old and you cannot put it out all the time and people cannot see it all the time. So VR is a great solution for that, so people can see it. <laughs> And very closely in the almost real kind of setting. So it's not just 2D an image or just a video. Um, and there's another thing is about accessibility, so you just touch upon that as well. So of course coming to the museum is a great experience. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a crowd, there's lots of people, but seeing the real things is always the unique experience. But unfortunately there are a lot of people who cannot do that. Um, so VR is a great way. And the last thing is, I think, it's definitely a new medium, a material for artists. That's what we've seen. I think that's something that's quite a surprise to us. You know, when we work with um, artists for Ben Spinali, and we just see a completely new way to using that technology. That's quite amazing for us. Right, so what I hear is that on the creator's side, it enables a if in uh, like what we saw with the brush, uh, it's something like a new kind of sculpture that's like sculpted in the air. And so that is a, a new medium. And in synchronous settings, it's like a new way of theater that combines uh, spaces together. So these are new forms of art. But for the original forms of art, what I hear is that curation is still very important. And without curation, most of the original art's uh, context may be decontextualized uh, into just simple remixing. And that worries, of course, the curators. And so I think that's an excellent um, answer to this question. And following uh, right on is actually a very pertinent question. Um, so whenever we're in virtual reality, our imagination opens, and we're able to imagine previously unimagined things, obviously. But do that also create blind spots? Like, are there something that, because of virtual reality, that we should pay attention to, but then it distracts us from it? Or that by deploying virtual reality, we become systematically blind to some other possibilities? It's a very provocative uh, question. Um, and it's not necessary for everyone to answer that, <laughs> but if you have anything to contribute, I think there's a very provocative question, especially in light of the previous round of questions. So first, I'd like to ask Amian. Uh, I 但它绝对不会是中心性
我的意思是说，这就是我刚才一开始说，新的科技、新的时代，一定要有新的规则跟新的伦理，甚至新的警觉性。这是一个很。严重的问题，在整个的人文、嗯、社会，哎，的这一方面，一定要好好的去面对它的。另外一个就是，从比较呃低层次的来说，对于博物馆来看的话，它就是对于原来的状态的冲击力道很大。这个冲击力道。每一个博物馆，每一个社会，它的承受能力多大，这个呃也必须考虑。另外就是，但是它其实是提供了一个，提供的，可以说是你无法想象的，无法数，呃，现在就很清楚的可以知道的那个无限的可能性，那个无限的可能性是很吸引人的，但是那个对于既有的。各种状况的冲击，是我们所惧怕的。那所以，呃，像譬如说故宫，嗯，呃，会呃做这样的事情，甚至办这样的，呃，这个，这个研讨会，其实就是说，我们正面的面对这一个，呃，怎么逃，怎么，怎么。呃，你你回避都回避不了的冲击，但是我们必须心头了的啊！<笑>真的，老实说，像我这种年纪，再加上我的文科背景，老实说，我真的是啊，既爱又恨。我不断的讲，不断呃，既爱又怕。我不断的讲这句事情，这句话是真的。这是一个。人类文明史上很新的要面对的大课题。So, um, I think this love slash uh fear not hate uh relationship um it, it is real. And uh, what what's important uh here to be reminded of is that uh fear actually is a blind spot. Uh, fear blinds people to the future, and uh, by facing. The future and our fear, uh, and letting the future go through us uh, to the present, uh, one becomes less blinded uh, to the possibilities. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that the point is virtual reality is not reality at all. It's uh, interpretation, and uh, and of course, as any uh, interpretative process, uh, it has a blind blind spot. Because um, it's um, it's built to open uh, the the narrative, the creation, you know, the creators of the uh, VR uh, have uh, wanted it to have. So in fact, um, it's quite important to to say that because uh, it's important to tell people that virtual reality is not reality, and that even reality, I mean. The core reality, of course, it's, not easy, it's never easy to speak about oralism, but still, the core reality needs to be interpreted. And uh, that's the reason why I think it's um, for us within the Louvre, uh, who are very much interested in this first uh, experience of VR. It's something that we have been uh, doing very carefully, thanks to HTC, and thank you very much, my dear. And, um, uh, and, but it's an experience, and it's something that we have been uh, done for the first time. Of course, that, do, that we will continue, I'm sure of that. But it's something that needs, and it's, um, it was very interesting for me to follow the, the overall experience. And uh, I, followed, I followed it very carefully, because I understood that um, each time we have been doing something in terms of technology, we have needed to, um, exp you know, in fact, to um, assess it in terms of content. Uh, and technology is something, of course, and you remember when we were working together, technology is the thing, but we need to say something that could be maybe not right, but as right as possible. And, um, and technology is nothing without knowledge. And it's nothing without content. It's nothing without assessing this content. 
So um, for me, it's very close to uh, what Marcus was saying about cinema. It's very close to cinema, and, we, and with Cecilia, we were uh, telling that. And it's very close to the first, um, in fact, uh, movie directors at the end of the 19th century or beginning of the 20th century, where they need to create something new. Uh, and of course, with, with reality, because it's face, cinema needs to have reality, in, in fact, in front of the camera, but still with interpretation. And it's the same way of doing that. So, of course, they, they are blind spots, and we need to tell people about their blind spots. I'm not claiming for the VR reality at the loop about Mona Lisa, I'm not claiming that it is the actual Mona Lisa. Of course, not. It's our interpretation of what she could have been. And it's very important to say so. And if you say so, if you are clear enough with that, and if also you, uh, you are creating other devices along to the VR, then it's clear. If you tell people this is reality, then that thing are part of it. In a nutshell, when need to be inclusive when designing with not for VR, and if it becomes exclusive to VR only, then we have a problem. Yeah. So I totally agree. Uh, I won't add uh, many things. Just, just uh, I, I wish to stress again that uh, uh, its reality is not only vis visuality. And I think it's very important that uh, the reality, of course, is not a simple image. And you have also, you know, the thought and smell and, and so on. So uh, it's, for me, it's a bit frightening to, to imagine that uh, the way to, to, to feel the reality would be only through the image. And uh, it's, Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's more and more like this, and so our, our sense of reality is, uh, is perhaps a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, poor now. It's, it's, it's a, a danger. You said a blind spot is like a hit death spot. <laughs> we would become handicapped by the over concentration of vision. I think um, as, as curators and as creators, we just need to be aware of that we all have these blind spots. And as we adopt new technologies, to, to when, we, when we catch ourselves with these blind spots, to when we do something next time, we mitigate for that. And, and to be considered and thoughtful and, and look at our processes and, and try always to make things um, over a period of time the best they can be. Um, yeah, I don't know whether to call it a blind spot or just a challenge. I think uh, with a new media like VR, I always say it changes the way people tell stories. So for example, yes, yeah, cinema. So it's when you write a script with VR, is completely different perspective. So the first person's experience is not just like you watching the screen. So with a immersive um, medium like this, I feel like you know if you've done it badly, <laughs> then it is worse. So yeah, you feel not just bored, but you feel dizzy. That's technology, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so yes, I think with VR, it's just very important, like how to tell the story. So it's that's why I said it's very important you when you work with our partners, you know, it's not like us creating this. It's work with them to tell their stories, to you know, verify the contents and every detail. You just need to make sure that is correct. Then you can provide a, a really good experience for the visitors. But if you do it not so well, then it becomes worse for the actual the experience. And never design experience that one would not like to experience oneself. <laughs> I think this is uh, very important in the sense that the blind spots will keep changing as the uh, medium uh, evolves and the reminder about inclusion again is very important. So um, in the light of uh, the spirit of inclusion, if anyone who don't have a mobile phone or who 
don't prefer typing your questions. Now is a, a chance to be included. Uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hands and, and ask any question uh, to the panelists. 如果用手机打字比较不习惯或不方便的朋友们
I think this is excellent that the, the chief curator reminds us that curation is not only about taste. Curation is by itself a art, a creative process of interpretation. And if uh, digital technologies can help us democratizing uh, this uh, creative process, then it's actually a really good sign. It's not only pessimistic <laughs> when we talk about original art and stuff. Uh, it's also about broadening the materials that this interpretative process can work with. As you, as you all know, museums were created for the artist, and, um, and especially uh, when the Louvre was created at the end of the 18th century, uh, it was meant for, for the artists themselves to help them to, uh, to uh, know more about uh, ancient art or the, the art uh, before them. So I think it's quite important to always to remember that museums are places for artists, and for artists to uh, uh, of course, to show their works, but also for artists to, to train, to, to, to see uh, uh, ancient art. Um, within the Musée du Louvre, to, um, to help people to have the, um, the feeling of uh, the, the way uh, artists have been created, uh, we, uh, we are designing small films from videos and uh, just explaining, for instance, uh, uh, the, all the technology, all the techniques of drawings and printing, and we show them in, uh, in specific in, uh, in specific galleries in, uh, in links with uh, um, graphic art collections. So it's very important. And uh, one of the big issue for museum and uh, is to show the work of art behind uh, what people are, are, are seeing because. Uh, we, um, we uh, some surveys we have been uh, doing with our visitors uh, has have shown us that um, people, in a way, are mixing uh, the work of art. And, uh, oh, anyway, I'm not especially understanding that the work of art they are seeing uh, is the consequence of creativity. They are seeing the work of art as an object or as an image. It's painting. And not understanding that behind that, there is all the creative process. And it's very important for us to explain them the creative process before. And it's not that easy, because uh, more and more, they are not spending a lot of time uh, in front of works of art. We are seeing that they are spending two, three, four, five, six, ten seconds, which is not enough to understand. So. Uh, our, our goal and our duty, is not only a goal, but I think it's our duty, is to uh, help people to spend as much time as they need to in front of works of art. But it's not easy, because when, um, when you are not used with the work of art, they, are, uh, they, they can be quite scary in a way. It's quite scary to look at the work of art when you are not uh, used to. So that's uh, all the the need for interpretation and, of course, technological interpretation is very important, but human interpretation is very important. And so something we are doing now, uh, and more and more, is not only to have more and more devices, but also to have more and more people, you know, human beings, actual human beings, to welcome people and to expand them. And things also we are doing is to um, invite artists not only to show uh, their uh, creation within the Musée du Louvre, even if the Musée du Louvre is an ancient uh, art museum, but we are also inviting contemporary artists, and we just opened a, a beautiful exhibition on Pierre Soulages, and Pierre Soulages is a very important painter, and he is celebrating his uh, uh, 100th uh, birthday this year, and we have also an uh, invitation to other younger contemporary artists, but we are also inviting um, Less famous artists, I may say so, but for artists who, for instance, um, uh, students at the Ecole des Beaux Arts or, or, or people like that, to help uh, visitors what is uh, uh, the creation process and where is creativity behind creation and creativity behind the, the art, the, the, the works of art they are, they are looking at. I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about the, the VR and, uh, and 
it's a way to understand the creativity of the modern or contemporary art. But I think, for example, that the, the high resolution image is uh, more important to understand, for example, the, or to see the brush strokes and the process of the picturality, for example, in a in work of art. And uh, so, <clears throat> so I think in the in the VR, it's more a sort of a narrative of explanation about art, but uh, to 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 enter in the process of creativity is uh, is of course is is more easier through through this high high ray uh, image or through human uh, explanation. And another question is. Uh, uh, the VR used by artists. So this is another question. And I, I know some artists who play with, with this, uh, this technology. Um, I think of, for example, of uh, Pierre Louis, a French artist. But uh, it's, uh, it's really a part of their creativity and uh, a sort of reflection about fake reality and technology and so on. Uh, the immersive art is not uh, only, you know, it's not held by, by, uh, by the art only. Uh, you could, for example, the water release by Monet is immersive art, but also uh, video installation is, uh, is a very, very strong immersive art, art. So, so I, I, I think it's important to make this uh, distinction. I, I think I, I echo what Cecile is saying, that, that VR is, is one tool among many in which that people can respond creatively to, to artworks and to, to come up with, with new means of expression. For us, the, the afterlife of Alphonse Walker's work is very important and how the emotion that people feel as artists looking at Walker's work, we, we, we always try to encourage people to, to express that in their own ways through their own artistic mediums, whether they're a contemporary photographer who takes something as an idea and go with it, or whether they're a virtual reality artist, or, or uh, whether they're um, finding some new medium that we haven't, haven't yet established. Um, but I think that the, 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 for us at least, the, the thing that's really exciting about these media is just um, enabling new generations of artists to continue to, to build on the artistic tradition that, that comes before them and to, to see where that direction takes us in the future. Um, I think based on our experience, I think with using VR to create a work, whether it's an artwork or it's an installation or it's a storytelling, the film, it's a very collaborative sort of experience. So it's not just the museum and the artists, you know, of course we need a lot of other teams, you know, with Mona Lisa, for example, we have Creative Studio helping us in Missive here today as well. Um, we need um, technical advice, we need a historian, just like other you know, pieces, the storytelling, we need a visual artist, and so it's a very collective kind of work, so it's whether the museum, it's not just about the museum helping us, or us helping the museum, stuff like that, so it's the same with a, if it's a contemporary artist trying using VR to create something, I think it's the same situation. I, from our experience, we see, of course, there are a new generation of artists who has the technical um, knowledge, skills to create this artwork by themselves. But we also see a lot of traditional artists, whether it's a painter, a sculptor, and they wanted to use the VR and then come to us and asking the question. So, you know, of course they need a museum's help if they need some images and materials and assets and need exhibition space. And, and we provide a lot of um, experience and helping them. So I think at least based on our experience, it's a material that breaks the boundary of a lot of different fields and categories. So 
I think, um, I hope that answers your question, but this is basically my view based on it. Thank you. Uh, more very insightful answers, and, and thank you for uh, raising a high bandwidth question, like uh, as opposed to Slido, which has a constraint in, in textual interpretation, all those additional numerical information, as we can all witness, raised more um, resonance in our panelists. Um, so we're at time, and I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for offering very insightful answers and the tough questions here, uh, especially you know around. Uh, free software, free culture, and maintenance uh, by the uh, museum themselves instead of by uh, commercial contractors or uh, the role of AI as assistive intelligence, uh, augmented intelligence, just like assistive and augmented reality. All these are excellent topics. Maybe the MPM can host workshops for them uh, in the future. Uh, but for now, uh, our VR panel uh, is at a close, so please give a round of applause to our panel. Thank you. Let's take some pictures for uh, Mandarin. Okay, please stand up and we will take some pictures right now. 好，那请各位媒体朋友呢，可以往前啊，我们可以往前帮他们拍照。Okay, please look forward, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 好 ，OK， 呃，然后我们再次谢谢各位贵宾的参与啊，带给我们一场精彩的讨论。